Thank you, colleagues. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 2441 in the name of Graeme D on behalf of the Bureau setting out a stage two timetable. Can I call on the Minister to move the motion? Stage three timetable, President Officer. My pardon, stage three timetable. <laughs> uh, move, President Officer. Didn't mean to worry you, Minister. The question is, no one's asked to speak of the motion. The question is that motion 2441 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. So the next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Tide Pubs Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have with them the bill is amended at stage two, the marshal of the list and the grouping of amendments. As usual, I'll sound the division bell uh, and suspend proceedings for five minutes for the first vote of uh, the first vote on this bill, and each vote will last one minute. Members who wish to speak in a group should just press their button as soon as I call the group. We'll turn now to the marshalled list. Group one is on application of the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010 in relation to section 14. Now, I've just heard Andy Whiteman giving his valedictory remarks, but I'm going to call Amendment 2 in the name of Andy Whiteman in a group on its own. Andy Whiteman to move and speak to Amendment 2. Thanks very much, uh, indeed, Presiding Officer. Uh, Amendment 2 uh, aims to ensure the operation of an effective statutory arbitration scheme. Uh, I was concerned that the scheme proposed in the Bill is not to be governed by the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010. At present, the scheme allows for the arbitration rules of any institution to be adopted and for such arbitrations to be seated uh, in England or elsewhere. There is also no appeal mechanism in respect of an arbitration in the Bill, which seems unfair. I take the view that any statutory arbitration scheme in Scotland should follow the Scottish arbitration system and rules, be seated in Scotland and have the proportionate appeal processes within that system. Parties should not be deprived of the benefit of the procedure set out in the Arbitration Act. The Act was designed to augment and enhance statutory arbitration, and Section 16 of that Act has the effect that the Scottish arbitration rules set out in Schedule 1 of the Act and its substantive provisions will govern any arbitration carried out under a legislative provision. The rules set out a scheme which allows an arbitration to proceed from appointment of an arbiter to final and binding determination of the dispute, including appeals to the court. All that is needed to attract the Arbitration Act is for legislation to say that a dispute is to be resolved by arbitration or words to that effect. Almost 11 years on from Royal Assent, Section 16 of the Arbitration Act is still not in force. This is a matter for regret, and I would urge the Scottish Government to take action to bring the provision into force as soon as possible. Despite the delay in bringing this important statutory arbitration provision into force, drafting tools have been used by both the Scottish and UK governments to ensure that the approach to statutory arbitration can still apply to new statutory schemes. So there is precedent elsewhere for my amendments, such as the Food Safety Act 1990, as amended by the Food Scotland Act 2015. And this illustrates that the Scottish Government has considered this important for new arbitration schemes in previous bills. I understand that the Scottish Government shares my concerns on the approach to arbitration in the bill, but have indicated that this can be fixed by subordinate legislation in the future. I do not consider that an, appro that an appropriate approach to the development of primary legislation. My view is shared by Brandon Malone, Chairman of the Scottish Arbitration Centre and recently retired Judge of the Court of Session, Lord Glenny, Vice Chairman of the Board of the Scottish Arbitration Centre. My amendment will ensure that the arbitration scheme in the bill is rightly governed by the Scottish arbitration system, including that system's fair appeals mechanism before it's passed. I move Amendment 2. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Whiteman. Can I call the Minister, Jamie Hepburn? Uh, thank you, President Officer. Just briefly, can I uh, first see how uh, far we've uh, come on the bill. We're now considering only 13 amendments at Stage 3, when at Stage 2 we're looking at over 300. I'm sure I'm not alone in welcoming uh, that uh, fact. However, this area was not at one that it came forward at stage two. And as Andy Whiteman is he's clearly operating from a base of being well informed, it, the government does not support uh, Amendment 2. As we've heard, uh, Amendment 2 seeks to apply the arbitration scheme as set out in the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010 as uh, if the Act was in force. Uh, in the government's view and in my view, having discussed the matter with the member in charge, uh, Neil Bibby, uh, this amendment is simply not necessary and would create issues with how arbitrations under the bill are to be conducted rather than resolving those issues. One difficulty with Amendment 2 is it will apply the arbitration rules in the 2010 Act without resolving potential clashes between provisions in this bill, like those at sections 16 and 17 on fees and expenses, and provisions in the rules on that. Some of this may be resolved by section 16.3 of the 2010 Act, which provides generally that bill provisions trump the rules in some cases. But this sort of clash is what the power in Section 17 of the 2010 Act to modify legislation was designed to sort out. 
A delegated powers in this bill and in the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010 itself would therefore allow ministers to consider how the Scottish arbitration rules regime should most appropriately be applied in the context of the Tide Pubs Scotland Bill. This would be in tandem with the process of drafting and consulting on the Scottish Pubs Code where the detailed regulatory provisions will lie. Appropriate arbitration is, of course, important for business, and as Minister for Business, I recognise that arbitration is a cost-effective, fast and flexible way of resolving disputes outside of the courts. I am keen, therefore, that we get this right. I would like to reassure members, indeed stakeholders uh, watching, including the Scottish Arbitration Centre, that any issues can be worked through properly through consultation and engagement. And that engagement will, of course, include the Scottish Arbitration Centre, whose knowledge and input is valued. The time for such engagement, though, is when the code has been developed, not when the overarching legislation is being discussed. So I would therefore call on members not to support Amendment 2. Thank you very much, Minister. And could I call the member in charge, Neil Bibby? Thank you, President Officer. <coughs> and can I refer the Chamber to uh, my register of interest and the support I have received in relation to this bill? At the outset, can I thank Andy Whiteman for his interest in the Tide Pubs Bill and for the contribution he has made as a member of the Economy Committee and congratulate him on progressing his own bill to stage three today. Subsection 2 of section 14 of the Bill confirms that arbitration proceedings under the Bill must be conducted in line with the rules of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators or any other dispute resolution body nominated by the arbitrator. The purpose is to ensure that arbitrations are conducted in accordance with recognised sectoral rules and guidelines. Amendment 1 would leave out this subsection entirely and instead would provide that until the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010 is in force for any arbitration being carried out under subsection 1, that the Act is to be treated as applying as if it were in force for that arbitration. I have concerns about the construction of the amendment. For example, it leaves out all of subsection 2 rather than seeking to add a further provision to those already included. I also think there is a risk of seeking to put this on the face of the bill when ministers have up to two years to make the code and appoint an adjudicator. Can we be sure that what is agreed now will be fit for purpose by the time the code and adjudicator are in place? It may be that the 2010s Act's statutory arbitration provisions are enforced by the time this bill becomes operational law in a couple of years, leaving this approach unnecessary. Like the Minister, I think it would be better not to agree to this amendment today. And if the Scottish Government feels when the time comes that the bill needs to be linked to the 2010 Act more effectively, then it can use its power uh, already in the bill to make ancillary regulations. Therefore, I would ask Andy White not to move the amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Bibby. And can I call Andy Whiteman to wind up in this group? Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. And thank you to the uh, Minister and the member in charge for their uh, comments and I note the points that they have, have raised. And I certainly acknowledge that perhaps this could have been uh, raised earlier. I welcome the acknowledgement uh, by the Minister of the Scottish Arbitration Centre's expertise uh, and they indeed insisted me, assisted me, I should say, uh, in uh, this amendment. In, in light of the fact that I understand the um, SNP group and the Labour group will be opposing Amendment 2, um, I shall... Uh, um, I'll, I'll allow members to uh, remain in their offices for a little longer by, by, by not pressing this amendment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whiteman. So, Mr Whiteman wishes to withdraw Amendment 2. Does any member object? No. no. That's good. Thank you very much. We move to Group 2. This is on investigation into changes to pub leasing arrangements before Act fully in force. Can I call Amendment 3 in the name of Neil Bibby? This is grouped with Amendment 10. Neil Bibby to move Amendment 3 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I have lodged these amendments to allow the adjudicator to tackle an issue which has been of concern to the industry and to me for some time, and which has taken on new significance following amendments made to the Bill at Stage 2. The Bill was amended at Stage 2 so that the Government now has a maximum of two years extended from the one year originally in the Bill in which to make the code and appoint an adjudicator. I have said before I understand the very fair and legitimate reasons why the Government would wish to do so, not least because of the impact of Brexit and the COVID pandemic. I thank the Minister for his constructive engagement with me on this issue and on the Bill more generally. I was also grateful for the Minister's confirmation that this two-year time frame is, is not a target uh, and that the code and the adjudicator may well be in place sooner than the two years after the Bill is passed. However, there were already concerns amongst tenants and representative organisations that some pub-owning businesses may use the period between the bill passing and the code and adjudicator being in place to take steps to avoid the code by creating tied agreements by other means, which could take them outside the scope of the code and the adjudicator. These could include short-term agreements, self-employed management agreements or, and other forms of bogus self-employment. 
If this was to happen, it could have a significant impact on tenants' rights, on pubs and on consumers. I therefore lodged Amendment 3 to require the adjudicator within the first year of their appointment to start an investigation into any changes that were made to contractual terms in the period between the bill receiving royal assent and Section 7 of the bill, which relates to the unenforceable contract terms, coming into force. If those changes resulted in agreements not being covered by the Code. The amendment requires the report, which is to include an explanation of the adjudicator's findings, to be published and laid before the Parliament, which would allow for committees of the Parliament to scrutinise that report and for ministers to also give full consideration to it. Amendment 10 is a consequential amendment which allows the adjudicator to require a person on pain of prosecution to provide information in relation to this avoidance investigation by adding the investigation to the list of reasons for such information gathering set out in paragraph 4 of Schedule 2. Presiding officer, I respect the right of businesses to manage and structure their businesses as they see fit, if done so fairly and with good intent. However, I think most of us would agree that deliberately seeking to undermine the code before it is enforced is not desirable. For various reasons, it would not be possible for the bill to directly prevent such avoidance attempts. However, I ask members to consider these amendments uh, in my name and give the, uh, the adjudicator the power to investigate such behaviour and move amendment free. Thank you very much, Mr Bibby. And can I call the Minister, Jamie Hepburn? Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, say I am uh, aware and recognise and indeed understand uh, Mr Bibby's worries about uh, possible avoidance behaviour by pub-owning uh, companies in the period before the code comes into effect. This is also an issue that has been raised with me by the Scottish Licensed Trades Association. I would reiterate my observation that it is inherently difficult, of course, to avoid a code that is not yet uh, written. But I understand that uh, these concerns primarily come around, the, around the timescale for the implementation of the code. I just want to emphasise the point that Neil Bibby has made. The two years we have is very much a backstop. It is not, as Neil Bibby rightly said, it is not our target. We are committed to putting the code in place as soon as possible, with, of course, the appropriate uh, consultation. I do think, though, that uh, this is uh, an area that is worthy of debate and discussion. So, in that sense, I'm very glad that Neil Bibby has laid Amendments 3 and 10 to give us that opportunity to do so. As Neil Bibby has laid out, the amendments place a duty, duty on the adjudicator when first in office to begin an investigation into activities of pub companies in the period before the code was in place. I should say in the first instance, I am somewhat concerned that this might mean the adjudicator would be diverted from what is their fundamental task, the important task of starting to implement the code as it applies to Thai pubs in Scotland. Moreover, I am concerned that the process of investigation required by Amendment 3 could undermine the establishment of productive relationships between the adjudicator and the pub sector at their inception. We also need to establish a relationship of trust with all parties, and in that regard, I worry about the signal this sends. And Mr Bibby will recall that I have made that point directly to him. So I acknowledge the intentions behind these amendments, and I thank uh, Mr Bibby for talking them through with me, but I do not think these amendments are required for the reasons I have outlined. In my own amendment at stage two for the Code to specify circumstances where a market rent only lease need not be offered, and the proposals we will debate in Group 4 shortly are, I think, a better way to reassure pub-owning companies and encourage them to retain tied pubs. I think that is the fundamental concern that uh, this set of amendments uh, drives at. The Government is committed to ensuring that the bill and the uh, market rent only provisions are fair for both landlord and tenant. The Code will, of course, be subject to the fullest consultation. I have been clear on that. But so too will it be informed by the behaviour of all parties in the intervening period before it comes into effect. So I would urge all stakeholders to recognise that and to continue to work constructively with one another and indeed with the Scottish Government. On that basis, I would ask Mr Bibby to consider withdrawing Amendment 3. Thank you very much, Minister. And can I call on Neil Bibby to wind up in this group? 
Thank you, President Officer. Since I first lodged my proposal, I received numerous reports that pub companies would seek to avoid a statutory code by adjusting their operating model. Whenever Parliament chooses to regulate an industry, there will be a reaction within that industry. That is, that is inevitable. Uh, but I believe that the only reason pub companies would seek to actively avoid fair and proportionate regulation is if they know that at least some of their business practices are incompatible with the principles underpinning it. Similar threats were made by pub companies in England and Wales, which in many cases turned out to be exaggerated. The tide model continues to be a feature of the sector uh, there, albeit with tenants now empowered to seek a better deal. Uh, what does concern me is the possibility of so-called Uberisation in tide pubs. This may indeed attract the attention of other regulators, but the impact of the extension of the gig economy into the tide pub sector is something Parliament and any adjudicator we create should be aware, particularly in the period between royal assent and commencement. Uh, the coming months will shine a light on the conduct of pub companies in Scotland. Are they willing to engage with the fair and proportionate regulation, or will they disadvantage some of their tenants in a deliberate attempt to avoid it? I have listened to the uh, arguments made, particularly the uh, points made by the Minister, and I thank him for his reassurances, particularly on timescales. Again, I accept that as far as possible, we do have to proceed on the basis of good faith. Therefore, I will not press the amendment, uh, but we will be watching developments closely. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Baby. So, Mr. Baby wishes to withdraw Amendment 3. Is that agreed? Great. That is agreed. Thank you. Turning now to Group 3, this is on the Scottish Pubs Code requirement to offer guest beer agreement provided beer is provided by a small brewery. Can I call Amendment 4 in the name of Graham Simpson? And this is grouped with Amendments 5 and 6. Graham Simpson to move. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, these amendments ensure that the guest beer provision can only be used by a small brewer and not by a larger multinational brewer, which would already have existing routes to market. The current wording on guest beer would allow for any brewer, regardless of size or location, to take advantage of the provision. Uh, Amendment 4 is aimed at preventing a race to the bottom on price, which would only result in smaller domestic brewers being priced out. Now, Neil Bibby helpfully mentioned Straven Ales during stage two. And Straven is near to where I live in East Kilbride, presiding officer, and I can attest to Straven Ales fine produce. So I'm applying the Straven Ales test here to ensure smaller breweries get a fair slice of the cake. Without these amendments, far from encouraging more domestically produced beer into our pubs, we would actually see fewer opportunities for smaller brewers to access pubs due to a need for the pub-owning company to compete in their own premises with larger brewers. Far from encouraging more Scottish beers into Scottish pubs, the bill unamended would actually result in fewer domestic brands uh, from smaller, produ smaller producers appearing in Scotland's tied pubs. It would fail the Straven Ales test. Furthermore, the wording in the bill could be seen to prevent any further parameters being set on guest beer in the subsequent code due to the line in the bill, regardless of who produces it. Amendment 4 seeks to address this point by stipulating it is, quotes, provided by a small brewery. Amendment 6 subsequently grants the power to define what a small brewery is in the code, and these amendments uh, are all aimed at ensuring that the bill does what I believe the member intended when bringing forward the legislation. Thank you very much, Mr Simpson. Uh, so I could just ask the member to move Amendment 4? Yes, I'll move it. Thank you very much. Can I call the Minister, Jamie Hepburn? Thank you, President Officer. There was considerable discussion of the guest beer provisions in the bill at Stage 2. A number of similar amendments were lodged at Stage 2, were voted on and defeated. I made it clear then and will reiterate now that the Scottish Government is keen to encourage the supply of local craft beers and pubs in Scotland for the benefit, benefit of producers and consumers. So in that sense, I am not unsympathetic to Mr Simpson's aims and certainly recognise his good intentions with these amendments. I should say to Mr Simpson, I have not ha yet had the good fortune of having sampled any Straven ale, but I look forward to being able to do so at some point in due course. As I also said at stage two, I am considering how the guest beer arrangements under the code might be shaped using the existing provisions in the bill. My view then and still remains that the detail in this matter would be best laid out in the code rather than the face of the bill, 
which may cause difficulties in its implementation. The detail in the code would, as I have said before, indeed today, and will reiterate again, it will be subject to wide consultation and consideration would, of course, be given as how to support small breweries in that context. In my view, that is the correct approach rather than by being prescriptive on the face of primary legislation. And on that basis, I would urge members not to support the amendments in this group. Thank you very much, Minister. And can I call on Neil Bibby? Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the amendments in this group seek to restrict the guest beer right to beers from a small brewery only, with the definition of small brewery to be set out in the code. They would remove the freedom and flexibility as to the producer of that guest beer presently provided for in the bill. As I made clear at stage two, when various amendments were debated which sought to restrict the terms of the guest beer right, I have sympathy with the amendment and with the principle of looking to support and encourage small brewers and businesses and get more Scottish pubs stocking uh, local craft beers. However, I fundamentally support tenants being able to choose which guest beer to sell depending on their own circumstances and customer preferences. That was the underlying principle on which I based the guest beer right as set out in the bill and I'm therefore opposed to amendments which seek to limit which beers can and which cannot be chosen as a guest beer. The bill requires the code to specify the circumstances in which the offer must be made and I believe that is appropriate. The consultation process and then the code is the best place to consider such matters, not the bill itself. Finally, President Officer, I believe the bill as it stands will benefit Scotland's brewers and protect Scotland's small brewers, including the MRO provision. It will enhance opportunities for Thai publicans to, Scot to stock Scottish brewed products right across the Thai estate. This bill is already a game changer in that regard. I therefore urge members to reject the amendments in this group. Thank you, Mr Bibby. And can I call on Mr Simpson to wind up in this group? Nothing to add. Does Mr Simpson wish to press Amendment 4 or to withdraw it? Uh, on the basis of what's been said, I won't press. Thank you very much, Mr Simpson. So Mr Simpson seeks to withdraw Amendment 4. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 5? Does Mr Simpson wish to move Amendment 5 or not move? No. Not moved. Can I call Amendment 6 again? Move or not moved? No. That is not moved. And we're going to turn now to Group 4. This is on the Scottish Pubs Code, requirement to offer market rent only lease. Can I call Amendment 12 in the name of Graeme Simpson? And this is grouped with Amendments 13, 8 and 9. I would also point out that if Amendment 9 is agreed to, I cannot call... Sorry, if Amendment 8, I beg pardon, is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 9. It'll be preempted. Graeme Simpson, to move Amendment 12 and speak to all amendments in the group. Move, move Amendment 12. Um, these amendments are aimed at providing some clarity for pub owning businesses and the tied pub tenants who have all raised concerns about the impact to investment in their businesses due to the current wording of the bill. The amendments ensure that some parameters are subsequently set in the detail of the code that can give a limited degree of confidence that investments into sites can continue at this crucial point in the recovery for the sector. As currently drafted, there could be no protections contained within the code and crucially no foresight beyond the comments of the current minister. Now this creates significant problems for pub companies in identifying funding uh, and in conversations with lenders. Even with these amendments there's still real concern from both landlords and tenants about the impact on future investment and a degree of uncertainty and investment risk in tied pubs is now inevitable which is a real shame. At the very least, however, these amendments would ensure that there must, rather than may, be some provisions to enable a return uh, any investment made without the risk of an MRO being triggered during this time. This is the only difference, but a critical one, to the amendment proposed by the government. Now, since the introduction of the Code in England and Wales, that was in 2016, the Scottish pub share of GB wide spend has doubled. Without acceptance of these amendments, uh, that could be reversed, putting Scotland's tide pub sector at a competitive disadvantage in comparison to the rest of the UK. The whole hospitality sector, as members well know, is on its knees at the moment, and investment will be crucial in aiding their recovery, so these amendments seek to give them a limited degree of confidence moving forward at this time. Thank you, Mr Simpson. And can I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 9 and the other amendments in this group? Thank you, Mr Officer. I welcome these amendments which concern a part of the bill that is crucially important to both landlords and tenants. That this remains the case is clear from discussions I've had with stakeholders 
since stage two. So it's right that we are able to debate this issue uh, this evening. It is important that the market rent only provisions are fair for both landlords and tenants. That's why I introduced amendments at stage two to allow Scottish ministers to set out in the code the circumstances in which a market rent only lease need not be offered. The development of code is of course subject to consultation, but as I've said, my strong inclination is that investment should be one of those circumstances. I want to reassure sure pub owning companies that Scotland is open for business and welcomes investment in Scottish tied pubs. I want pub owning companies to have confidence and to continue to invest in this important sector. My Amendment 9 provides assurance for the sector about the Scottish Government's commitment to protecting the position of pub companies with regard to investment. The amendment strengthens my amendments at stage two, the provisions on MRO leases, and reflects the conversations I've had with stakeholders about this element of the bill, both landlords and tenants, and of course, with Mr. Bibby. I believe the amendment has strong support and improves the balance of the bill. My stage two amendment deliberately included the word may before specifying the circumstances in which the lease may not be offered. It provides flexibility in terms of when an MRO has to be offered. The default position remains that a pub owning business would still be required to offer an MRO lease. Amendment 13 makes it a requirement for the code to set out the circumstances in which an MRO, well, MRO need not be offered. This, in my view, perhaps goes too far and removes the flexibility that the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee has endorsed by supporting my stage two amendment. Whilst I, I welcome that Mr Simpson has acknowledged and incorporated the investment wording of my Amendment 9, I do not think that Amendment 13 is necessary, and Amendments 8 and 12 are, of course, consequential to it. I do not support the amendments in uh, Mr Simpson's name, and instead ask members to support my Amendment 9. Thank you very much, Minister. And can I call on Neil Bibby to speak to this group? Thank you, President Officer. Uh, under the bill as introduced, the Code had to require pub owning businesses to offer a market rent only lease to a tenant who requested such a lease. There were no exceptions. As a result of the amendments moved by the Minister, as he's just referenced at stage two, it's now possible for the Code to specify circumstances in which a market rent only offer need not be made by a pub owning business. Amendment 13 would go further, making it a requirement rather than a possibility for the Code to set out circumstances in which an MRO offer need not be made. It also includes an example, rather than a requirement, that an agreed investment may be a reason for, MRO, for an MRO offer not to be made. The investment example is also subject uh, of the Minister's own amendment in this group, Amendment 9, which I will come on to in a moment. I remain satisfied that the Minister's amendments at Stage 2 strike the right balance, and I will not be supporting uh, Graeme Simpson's amendments in this group. I therefore ask members not to support Amendments 13 and 8. Amendment 12 is a consequential amendment that is not required if Amendment 13 is not agreed to, so I will not be supporting that amendment either. As I have already explained, the Minister's Stage 2 amendment means that Paragraph 5, uh, Subsection 3 of Schedule 1 allows but does not oblige the Code to specify circumstances in which a pub owning business need not offer to enter into a market rent only lease with a tenant. Amendment 9 would add an example of such a circumstance, which is where an agreement to invest in a Thai pub has been entered into. This amendment does not change the scope or legal effect of the bill and may be helpful in providing an indication of the sort of circumstances that may be consulted on and considered for inclusion in the code and may also help improve tenant and pub company relations. I believe that such a measure could be beneficial for all involved, tenants and pub owning businesses. I will therefore be supporting Amendment 9 for that reason. Thank you, Mr Bibby. And could I call on Graham Simpson again to wind up in this group? Uh, again, nothing to add. So can I ask uh, Mr Simpson, does he wish to uh, press or withdraw Amendment 12? Uh, I wish to withdraw it. Thank you very much, Mr Simpson. Mr Simpson wishes to withdraw Amendment 12. Does any member object? Yes. That's good. Can I call Amendment 13? Does Mr Simpson wish to move or not move Amendment 13? Not, not moved. moved. Thank you. Amendment 8, Graeme Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Can I call Amendment 9? In the name of the Minister, Minister to move. It moved, President Officer. Thank you very much, Minister. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, thank you. Turning now to Group 5. This is on the Scottish Pubs Code Adjudicator. Power to require information. Can I call Amendment 1? In the name of Neil Bibby. This is a group on its own. Neil Bibby to move and speak to Amendment 1. 
Thank you, President Officer. Amendment 1 in my name is a minor and technical amendment. Uh, paragraph 4 of Schedule 2 deals with the adjudicator's powers to require information, and subparagraph 2 lists the, subject, uh, sub the, purposes, the, uh, lists the purposes for which the adjudicator may require information. Unfortunately, there is an error in sub, uh, subparagraph 2b, which currently refers to a subsection of the bill which does not exist and is also not worded accurately. Amendment 1 corrects that error without changing the intention behind the provision. Amendment 1 ensures that the adjudicator can require information for the purpose of monitoring whether the requirement to comply with a direction given under subsection 92a has been fulfilled, which has always been the policy intention. I therefore move Amendment 1. Thank you very much. Minister, do you start anything? Just very briefly to uh, commend Mr Bowie's eagle-eyed nature and uh, urge members to support this amendment. Thank you very much. Does Mr Bowie wish to add anything? No, thanks, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 10 in the name of Neil Bowie? This was debated earlier. Neil Bowie to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Turning to Group 6, this is on the Scottish Pubs Code Adjudicator Assistance from the Scottish Ministers. Can I call Amendment 11 in the name of Andy Whiteman? This is in a group on its own. Andy Whiteman to move and speak to Amendment 11. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Amendment 11 relates to the staffing of the new adjudicator. It allows for the Scottish Ministers to, quote, ensure the provision of staff, end quote, in respect of the adjudicator, allowing greater flexibility in the approach to staffing and supporting the adjudicator. I was concerned that the provisions around staffing were restricted to ministers directly providing staff or the adjudicator seconding staff from other bodies. And my amendment will ensure that ministers can work with the adjudicator on the appropriate mechanism for the staffing, which might include a contract for service with another body. The wording in the amendment is used in the School Consultation Scotland Act 2010, as amended by the Children and Young People, Scotland Act 2014. This allows ministers to work with the convener of the school closure review panels to ensure that there's a contract for service in place to administer that body and support the panels. I consider that this amendment provides ministers and the adjudicator with wider scope for staffing and supporting the work of the adjudicator. I move Amendment 11. Thank you very much, Mr Whiteman. Can I call the Minister first of all? Thank you, President Officer. This amendment concerns the powers for Scottish ministers to provide assistance to the adjudicator, including for staff, services or facilities with or without charge. Uh, President Officer, I do not think that the amendment is necessary, particularly as the levels of assistance uh, that will be required are expected to be low. For example, we do not expect the adjudicator to need many staff, and any assistance from Scottish ministers in that regard is likely to be provided directly with the secondment of Scottish Government staff, which is already explicitly provided for in the Bill. Moreover, the Bill already contains sufficient powers for the adjudicator to enter into contracts with other parties or for Scottish ministers to enter into contracts on their behalf. So, simply put, President Officer, I think the concerns that Mr Whiteman has raised are already accounted for in the Bill, and consequently I would ask members not to support this amendment. Thank you, Minister. I'm going to call on Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, amendment 11 seems to be aimed at ensuring that Scottish ministers can help to contract other services and with other bodies to provide support to the adjudicator. The, the amendment is no doubt well intentioned, but seems to be misconceived and would serve no practical purpose. There is no need for the words may provide to be supplemented by or ensure the provision of. If the adjudicator wants to con contract with others for staff, for example, it has powers to do that already under paragraph 24 of Schedule 2. Paragraph 11 of Schedule 2 is a provision to empower ministers, not the adjudicator, and providing the sort of support around contracting that the amendment seems aimed at is something ministers can already do under the bill, should the adjudicator want that, given the flexibility for them under paragraph 11 to provide other assistance. I therefore do not support this amendment and ask Mr Whiteman to consider withdrawing the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Bebe. And can I call on Mr Whiteman to wind up in this group? Thanks, Presiding Officer. Nothing to add. I note the comments from the Minister and the Member and will not be pressing this amendment. Thank you, Mr Whiteman. Mr Whiteman seeks to withdraw Amendment 11. Does any member object? No. No one does. And that ends consideration of amendments. Now, as members may know, at this stage in proceedings, I am required understanding orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the Bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system or franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this Bill, it does no such thing. Therefore, the Tide Pub Scotland Bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at Stage 3. So we're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 24271 in the name of Neil Bibby on the Tide Pub Scotland Bill at Stage 3. Could I invite all members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons? And I call on Neil Bibby to speak to and to move the motion. 
Thank you, President Officer. It gives me great pleasure to open stage, uh, today's stage three debate on the Thai Pubs Scotland Bill. I lodged the draft proposal for this Member's Bill over four years ago. If the, the Bill is passed today, it will be the result of an entire session's worth of work. And I would like to thank all those who have played such a vital part in getting the Bill to this stage. The Scottish Licensed Trade Association, who have consistently championed the rights of least and tenanted publicans and small businesses in the licensed trade. The Campaign for Real Ale, who represent so many pub lovers and have campaigned for more choice for consumers. Our trade unions, in particular the GMB and the STUC, who represent workers in the brewing sector. Greg Mulholland, who was instrumental in securing cross-party support for Thai pub reform in England and Wales as a Member of Parliament. Campaigners like Chris Wright. And a wider, powerful, persuasive coalition, the Scottish Cooperative Party, Tenant Caledonian, FSB Scotland, the Society of Independent Brewers, and many more who have uh, given support to Thai pub reform, uh, and more that I could name today. I also want to recognise the work of Nick Hawthorne, Neil Ross and Kate Blackman and all at the Non-Government Bills Unit, parliamentary staff and the uh, Scottish Government officials. And also my own staff, Joe Fagan and Enema Hyman, for their invaluable support and all their uh, work throughout the past few years. In particular, I also want to thank the Minister for his interest and engagement on the Bill and his role in ensuring the Bill proceeded with government support. Jamie Hepburn has shown leadership on this issue uh, that will be recognised by the licensed trade and pub tenants. And I certainly want to recognise the leadership he has shown here today and over the past few months, which has meant uh, progressing with this bill uh, was possible. Uh, Thai pubs have been around for a long time. The basic idea is sound, that a pub is owned by a business and leased to a tenant to manage. That tenant will pay below the going market rent for the pub, but in turn must buy its alcohol from the business at a higher rate than would be the case on the open market. The business is expected to provide other support and assistance to the tenant, although, as the committee heard, that support is not always specified in the tied agreement. Over the years, that basic model has eroded. Rents have increased, as have markups on alcohol, and many tied tenants found themselves locked into unfair contractual terms. That resulted in far too many tenants barely earning a living, despite often working long hours in a demanding job. According to an SLTA survey last month, 60 per cent of tenants earn less than the minimum wage when the hours they worked was taken into account. It has become clear that the sector cannot regulate itself fairly and that action is needed. In 2015, the UK Parliament passed legislation on a cross-party basis which led to the creation of a Thai pubs code and adjudicator for England and Wales. Thousands of Thai tenants in England and Wales now benefit as a result. It is true that not all in that 2015 Act worked as well as was hoped. That is in no small part to some of the pub code-backed amendments that tied down the code and the adjudicator. This bill does not replicate the UK legislation, but improves on it and simplifies it where possible. It may have taken six years, but I am delighted that, should the bill be passed today, Thai tenants in Scotland can look forward to having a Scottish code and statute with a Scottish pubs code adjudicator to govern and enforce that code. The code and adjudicator will give companies that own Thai pubs in Scotland and their tenants a clear, fair and proportionate framework to operate within and abide by, one that will allow the sector in Scotland to flourish. I thank the Minister and his team for the collaborative approach they have taken since stage one in working with me on the bill. That approach led to 18 stage two amendments being lodged, uh, some by me and some by the Minister, that we both supported. The amendments made to the bill at stage two included allowing a longer period for the government to make the code and appoint an adjudicator, longer review periods so that the impact and effectiveness of the code can be properly assessed, ensuring that investigations into alleged breaches of the code will take account of tenants' behaviour and include time limits, and perhaps most significantly allowing the code to set out circumstances um, in which a market rent only offer need not be made by a pub owning business. The market rent only option, or MRO as it is known, remains a certain central part of this bill. I watched with frustration as the MRO in England and Wales became bogged down in a morass of complicated rules and barriers. The MRO provision in this bill is simpler and cleaner. However, to encourage positive relationships, it is right that the Code can set out situations where the MRO offer is not open, for example, if a significant investment is being made by a pub-owning business into a tied property. The aims of this bill remain those set out in the three principles that can be found in Section 3 – fair and lawful dealing, that Thai tenants should be no worse off because of the Thai, that Thai deals provide a fair share of risk and reward. Passing this bill will see those aims realised. Deputy President Officer, although today will hopefully prove to be the end of a long journey for this bill, it is only the start of a new chapter for the sector. 
The next session of the Parliament will see the Scottish, Parliament, uh, Scottish Government consulting fully, meaningfully and thoroughly on a draft code. It will be vital for the future of the sector to get that code right. The draft regulations which contain the final code must gain parliamentary approval and there will be an opportunity for detailed scrutiny both by the committee and the wider Parliament. The next session will also see the selection of the first adjudicator, an appointment that must also be approved by the Parliament. It is my hope that after today, pub owning businesses and tenants and their representative bodies put aside any differences and work together collaboratively and constructively to ensure the success of the code, which will benefit so many people in Scotland. Presenting officer, I move the Tide Pub Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you very much. I now call on Jamie Hipper. Thank you, President Officer, and can I begin by saying I'm very pleased to be speaking on behalf of the Government in this final debate on the Thai Pub Scotland Bill. Uh, this is, uh, of course, not a Government Bill, President Officer. I've been at pains to emphasise this throughout the process, but nonetheless, uh, I must uh, thank my officials for their efforts in supporting me through uh, the Bill process. Can I uh, also commend Neil Bibby for reaching this stage uh, today? It's not easy to take any uh, bill forward uh, in any circumstances, but that's particularly so without the support of a full civil service uh, assisting you. So I have to congratulate him on getting his bill to this uh, stage. As we have uh, heard, the legislation will promote fair and equitable treatment within commercial agreements. It will also rebalance the relationship between pub owning companies and Thai pub tenants. It is an important step forward for the Thai pub sector in Scotland and uh, the culmination, as we've heard, of many years' work by Mr Bivy, who first proposed this bill towards the start of this parliamentary session. As we come to the end of this parliament, it does therefore seem fitting that we consider whether or not to pass his uh, bill. I'd like to thank uh, Mr Bibby and his team for working closely with me and my officials for his ongoing dialogue and his openness. But I'd also like to thank the committee for their comprehensive consideration of the bill at stages one and two. President Officer, I arrived at a different conclusion to the committee at stage one. This was after a, a great deal of thought about the merits of uh, the bill. Uh, nonetheless, I, I appreciate the committee's clear and thorough report and examination of the evidence and reviews at both stages. It has helped influence uh, the Scottish Government's approach to the bill. It was a balanced decision as to whether or not we would support the progress of the bill, but some engagement fairly late in the day from a number of Thai pub uh, tenants it led me to conclude that if we were to follow the committee's recommendation to undertake more work to investigate this area, it would in all probability have led us to conclude the need to bring forward similar legislation to this uh, bill. I'd like to thank, having mentioned uh, that engagement, I'd like to thank the sector, uh, their representatives and tenants who took time to meet with me during the bill's progress. So too has their approach helped influence our approach. In so far as I will be involved, uh, I am keen that this spirit of cooperation between interested parties will continue into the implementation of the bill, uh, of course, should the Parliament pass it at decision time this evening. Uh, I have had a, an open-door policy on this matter because I have been keen to understand the issues across the industry as I consider uh, Mr Bowie's bill. I have listened carefully to all views and all concerns. I hope that you see that approach reflected today in the amendments put forward and agreed, because what I have sought to do is to ensure that the bill is fair and balanced for both landlords and tenants, for example, through the amendments on market rent only leases. These preserve the right to request a market rent only lease for tenants, but also provide safeguards for pub companies, particularly in relation to investment. This balance for landlords and tenants is crucial for the bill and it's crucial for the sector. I understand that this is an extremely challenging time for everyone involved in the pub sector, which has been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. I've heard about the support provided to many tenants by their pub companies during this time. This clearly shows the Thai pubs model has tremendous value and an important place in the pub landscape. It also provides a low cost entry point for people looking to make that first step into their business. I've heard both these things from Thai pub tenants. But this is not a uniform picture across the sector. I have also heard from some tenants who have not felt they have had this level of support 
and who believe change is required. So I want to preserve the benefits of the Tide at pub system. I recognise it as an important model of tenure. But I also want to ensure better balanced relationships between landlords and tenants. And I want that on a proportionate basis. If this bill is approved, the code will require to be implemented by whatever government is here after the election. This government is certainly committed to full and meaningful engagement. The development of the code falls to us. The code will govern the relationship between pub owning businesses and their tied tenants. It will need to be created within uh, two years again. But if it falls to this government, then we will look to do this as soon as possible. So I'd like to continue to work closely with stakeholders to ensure the code is one that works well for the whole of the sector. It's a sector I want to see recover and flourish. In that vein, I hope that we will all approach it with this bill in that spirit. And once again, I congratulate Mr Bibby on reaching this stage. Thank you, Minister. May I remind members at the back of the chamber that their voices do carry uh, in uh, a debate of this kind. And can I call Graham Simpson? Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We're near the end of this parliamentary session. We've just got a day to go, and all of us have been clearing out our offices, ready for the next occupant. Those of us who are standing again or, and who are lucky enough to return may end up back in the same room, or we may not. I'm not a great hoarder, but while I was clearing my office, I came across an unopened bottle of beer with a label urging me to support the Tide Pubs Bill. Goodness knows how it stayed unopened and forgotten about, but it has. And it was dated February 2018. And that just shows how long it can take for a member to get through the legislative process if they're lucky. I had my own abortive attempt at a member's bill around the protection of buyers of new homes, and I found it immensely frustrating. Having come from the fast-paced newspaper industry, I realised I need to show a little bit more patience. So I commend anyone who gets to the stage that Neil Bibby has arrived at. I say well done to Mr Bibby. He's been along a rocky road, but he's got there in the end. He put in a fair shift prior to stage one of this bill, trying to drum up support. Then it all went quiet for a bit, and some of us thought he'd drop the whole thing. But no, we got to stage one, and when the committee, which I was not on at that time, reported, it did not look good for Mr Bibby and his bill. The committee was divided, but the majority did not support the general principles. Members of my own party and the SNP members thought on balance that it should go no further. But here's a lesson for all who get to that point. Don't give up, because funny things can happen. It happened with Monica Lennon and her period products bill. It looks sunk. We and the SNP were against it. I see she's here. We were against it. Then, then my party stance was suddenly changed, and the SNPs did too. Hurdle crossed and on the bill went to its ultimate conclusion. And the same has happened here. We've changed our stance, uh, and the SNP have fallen into line too. Funny things happen, but Mr Bibby has made it, and well done. I've never had strong feelings about this bill one way or the other. You could argue it both ways, and the committee's stage one report reflected that. We're prepared to support the bill, but I have to admit, to having some reservations about it. I wonder what will happen to the hospitality trade, which has been hollowed out by lockdown. I fear the good intentions behind this bill may, and I stress may, lead to some pub companies deciding it's not worth investing in Scotland, or they could change their business models, Mr Bibby mentioned this earlier, and remove the tide option, which can be a route into the licence trade for some. That would be a shame but it could happen. I think you could easily argue that the time is not right for this bill if it ever was. I know there are a number of colleagues who share those concerns and there must be some on the SNP benches too. Emma McLaughlin, Chief Executive of the Scottish Beer and Pub Association, said the bill poses a real danger to future investment in the sector, entrepreneurship opportunities and threatens job, jobs. Now that said, it is the case 
that similar legislation was enacted in 2015 in England by the Conservative Government, uh, though the Tide pub sector is much larger there. That created a pubs code and an adjudicator which would govern the relationships between some Tide pubs tenants and their pub owning company landlords. Mr Bibby's bill aims to ensure that Scottish Tide pub tenants have at least the same protections and opportunities as those covered in the 2015 Act. It's in a better position than it was, thanks to some sensible amendments, and as I've said, we'll back it, albeit with some reservations. Now, before I sit down, my colleague Margaret Mitchell, who, who herself got a member's bill through, through, will close for us. This is Margaret's last speech as an MSP, so I don't expect her to say much of anything about this bill. She served the constituents of Central Region with distinction since 2003. Until, until 2016, she was the only Conservative representing the region. It's been a pleasure to work alongside her these last five years, and I wish her and Henry a happy and healthy retirement. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alex Rick. Thank you, President Officer. Um, can I begin by, on behalf of Scottish Labour, by congratulating Neil Bibby and his team for the tremendous amount of work they have done to get this bill to this stage. And hopefully the bill will be passed this afternoon, this evening. I would also thank the Minister for the positive approach which, which he has taken, which was evident at stage two when the bill came to the committee. Um, I want to focus on the Scottish Licensing and Trade Association have sent a letter to all MSPs today and they have made the following points which I think are worth restating. They state, for too long, large pub owning companies have taken more than their fair share from publicans. Too often they have held their tight tenants back, restricted consumer choice and failed to properly regulate themselves and keep their house in order. They have put their own profits before the sustainability of local pubs and fairness for Tide pub tenants. It cannot go on, they say. The Tide Pubs Bill delivers a fairer deal for Tide publicans with a new statutory pub code. It would be rebalanced Tide agreements, shifting power from the large pub codes to the local pubs who desperately need your help. It allows tenants to opt out of Tide pub deals that are not working. It will give publicans more choice over the drinks they stock to help meet consumer demand, promote Scottish products and sustain their businesses. The Tide pub's bill will also be very positive for Scotland's small brewers who at the moment are restricted from access to pubs owned by the big brewers and pub co's operating the tie. The fact that global brewers and pub co's are so desperate to stop this bill exposes the fact that they take too much from the pub profits. The reality is that the market rent only option is just that, an option, and if they want to keep publicans tied, they need to offer much better deals, lower prices and lower rents. That's all the bill calls for, fairness and a fair split of pub profits, which all MSPs must surely agree with. They make the point that in England, pub codes have continued to invest in pubs despite the pub code, and if they want to continue to own and operate pubs, they will do likewise in Scotland. I also wanted to make reference to the, the survey, presiding officer, that was carried out by the Scottish Licensing and Trade Association, because the key data points gathered from that survey are quite stark. 50% of Tide pub tenants report earning less than £20,000 a year, 34% less than £15,000 a year, and in many cases they say this will be for a couple, not for an individual. A shocking 58% of Thai pub tenants reported earning less than the minimum wage, with just 13% earning more than the minimum wage. 
The average price paid for a keg of standard lager by Tide Pubs is a staggering 61% higher than the open market prices, with some paying as much as 107% more than the open market prices. 81% report that information provided to them when they entered the lease was inaccurate or misleading. I think, presiding officer, that demonstrates why there was a need for this bill. I congratulate uh, Neil once again on bringing the bill forward, and I hope that everyone so will support that at decision time. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I now call Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, probably more than ever before, especially through this pandemic, we know the value of pubs as community assets, the social role that they play, the major employers that they are, but also that they showcase world-class Scottish products. I think this bill will help to rebalance the pub sector in Scotland in a way that has helped in England. But there is so much more to be done beyond this bill because of the impact of the pandemic on this sector. So this cannot be the end of the story. We need to look again at what support we can provide pubs to make sure they continue to play that essential role in our communities. Neil Bibby was generous in his uh, praise of Greg Mulholland, the former Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament, um, who championed this sector for many, many years. And through his hard work and diligence, the landscape in England and Wales has changed markedly. And um, I like the fact that Graham Simpson tried to claim it as a Conservative achievement in government, when in fact it was Liberal Democrat ministers um, who actually drove it through the business department. I don't often uh, refer or praise or boast about the coalition years, but this is one thing that I am prepared uh, to, to recognise. Um, I think there is one contribution that is missing from this debate uh, from a Conservative, and that is Maurice Golden. I think his contribution last time was quite remarkable and I would have enjoyed him participating in the debate uh, again today, but alas, he is nowhere uh, to be seen. Um, the pub code uh, and the adjudicator are assets to be lauded. Uh, it's, it's governed the relationship between the large pub-owning uh, companies and their Thai tenants in England and Wales. That has changed the landscape there, I think, for the better. Neil Bibby deserves huge credit for his determination and single-mindedness. Lesser politicians would have buckled by now, but he withstood the pressure from all sides and persuaded, maybe even charmed others to his way of thinking. That obviously had an effect in some degree uh, on the, the minister, who was a reluctant um, supporter at the beginning. In fact, he was opposed to it at the beginning. So obviously his charmed worked on uh, the minister. But also, I think it's worked on the rest of the sector as well, because, as the Minister referred to, if he's going to deny that he was charmed, I want to hear from him. Jamie Hepburn. I will leave others to consider the charmer otherwise of Mr Bibby. It's just to put on the record that actually at no stage did I state any opposition to this legislation. Willie Rennie. He was even charmed before he knew that he was charmed. That's quite an incredible admission. Neil Bibby's powers know no bounds at all. Um, but it is um, true that the profile of the sector in Scotland is different. Uh, there are fewer tied pubs. The tie may provide a way for new tenants in the sector to hone their skills and knowledge and to climb the ladder to having their own pubs. That's, I think, got to be recognised. And we should try and hold on to that where it's of benefit to the, to the sector. However, the support that this bill has received um, is an indication that there is a significant problem. Uh, the support from a range of trade organisations and trade unions cannot be ignored. And the fact that the sector itself, many in the sector, came to the Minister and tried to work out a workable bill, as far as they were concerned, I think is a recognition from them too, that there is change that is required. Neil's powerful evidence, I think, has been persuasive all round. Giving tenants more freedom to grow and develop their businesses with creativity has got to be encouraged. Sometimes the sign of a good law is that it is not often used. And I hope that this is the case in this circumstance, because Neil Bibby has already achieved changes in the sector before this legislation was introduced. And let's hope that that continues and the sector recognise that it's got to change for the better to make sure our pub sector thrives for many years to come. Thank you very much.
And I call Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I add my sincere congratulations to Neil Bebby, not just for lodging this bill and uh, and steering it through, but ensuring that he did the work of building consensus to get the bill to a point where it's going to be passed, and it will certainly pass with the support of the of the Green Group uh, of MSPs. I, I want to declare uh, from my register of members' interest not only my membership of the Cross Party Group on beer and pubs, which has no collective view on the bill, uh, but also my membership of CAMERA. And Neil Bibby is one of uh, a relatively select few MSPs that I've had the pleasure of bumping into at CAMERA beer festivals from time to time over the years. As CAMERA's evidence, in fact, states, the, uh, the pub companies do take more than fair, more than sustainable, as a share of profit from tied tenants. And this does often uh, leave tenants unable to earn a decent living. And the way that they're being expected to pay over the odds for the beer that they sell is clearly unfair. Even if some find the tied pub model uh, ag agreeable and, and might choose to stick with it, they should have the choice. And this bill will give them that choice. Over the years, I've been privileged to host a number of camera events uh, and uh, you know others with the uh, the brewing community in Scotland uh, in Parliament, and it's it's a really important opportunity to say that when we debate alcohol, very often we debate the social harm, the health harm, and those issues don't need to be downplayed at all. But we should also find opportunities to celebrate what's positive about a more diverse, decentralised model of pubs and brewing. The domination of a small number of giant companies is itself unhealthy and is a, a source of, uh, is a, a model which compounds the health harm uh, and public health harm that comes from alcohol. A more diverse uh, brewing sector and a more diverse pub sector with a greater number of smaller independent companies would be, in my view, a healthier way forward. And this bill will be one measure that helps to achieve that. Presiding officer, over the, the last year, as I've spoken both in Parliament and at other meetings uh, from this little corner of my living room, I've occasionally been teased for the fact that I keep my refreshments close on hand. Uh, and in a few debates uh, in this chamber, uh, that's been necessary. But today, I've made a slight change so that you can all see uh, that my taste covers the, the grain as well as the grape. Uh, and if I regret anything about today's debate, it's that I won't have the opportunity to buy Neil Bibby a pint in the Parliament bar after the end of the debate to celebrate his passing the bill. If I could think of nothing better, I would give him a chance to try optimistic future, especially brewed for the, the Green Yes campaign back in 2014. After a few years, probably not safe to open that one, but uh, perhaps I'll get the chance to buy him a beer when we all return. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. We'll move to uh, brief contributions to the open debate. Willie Coffey to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Thanks very much, President Officer. To say that the evidence that we heard was polarised during the passage of this bill is putting it mildly. And I think it's fair to say that members of the committee were more than a little disappointed with that. At the outset, the bill struggled to gain support of the whole committee. But Mr Bibby's persistence and his willingness to find a way forward at stage two gradually won that support. Of course, the Tories tried to sabotage the bill at stage two with hundreds of pointless amendments until they realised the mistake they were making and gave up their attempt to talk it out of parliamentary time altogether. Although the bill began its journey pre-COVID, it did take on new significance, in my view, as the impact on the tide sector and the wider pub sector became clearer during the pandemic, and we can see the continuing impact of this if we just take a walk on any of Scotland's high streets. The pubs were first to be closed and will probably be the last to reopen, and we know that sadly many may not reopen at all. So establishing a new pub code will allow Scottish ministers to set out the circumstances in which a market rent only lease offered. What that does is it ensures we get a balance between the rights for the pub-owning companies and their tenants. 
and I hope that will be helpful. It introduces consultation and engagement into the process, and it means that a tenant who is satisfied with their current lease arrangements is under no obligation to accept market rent only. All that should hopefully make for a stronger and more successful tenanted pub sector in Scotland. This member's bill, of course, applies to the tide sector, which accounts for around 17 per cent or around 750 pubs from our total of around 4,000. The profile of tide pubs in Scotland is much different to what it is in Wales and England, but the bill does offer some protections and increased consultation for it in Scotland, which the member continually reminded us. During the bill's earlier journey, research carried out by the government did not appear to back the case for change. There were sufficient voices telling us about problems with the tide sector, principally about higher costs of beers and ciders and property maintenance issues. On the plus side, the tide model can offer a cheaper way into pub management for many, with the added benefits of satellite TV and Wi-Fi being included, which might otherwise not be included and be too expensive for new entrants to pay for themselves. The arrangements that permit tenants to introduce at least one guest beer, of course, is, is a choice beyond the tide arrangement, and that will surely be welcomed from everyone. But I will leave it to others, presiding officer, to give us a flavour of that and the other aspects of the bill. So, congratulations finally to Neil Bibby for bringing the bill through, to our committee clerks for supporting us, and to the Scottish Government for showing a willingness to listen to the pleas from the sector and for ultimately supporting the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Boyack to be followed by Colin Beatty. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I also want to congratulate my Labour colleague Neil Bibby for getting to this stage of the Tide Pub Scotland Bill and to recognise all the hard work he has put in to get here, but also all the witnesses who gave evidence to the committee that was then considered by the committee. This bill, as others have said, is supported by Scotland's unions, trade unions, camera, and many of the pubs across our country. And it puts power in the hands of consumers and tenants, not multinational pub companies. I think it's a really important step in bringing tied pubs in Scotland into line with those in England and Wales, something the FSB identified as important to the sector. And as others have said, I think it's absolutely vital that we support this sector, the small pubs in our communities. And I'm glad that they're going to get the flexibility and the new choices they need. Hospitality is a key sector of our economy, and as we build back from the pandemic, I am glad that this bill will give them more choices, more support, as we begin to see pubs thinking about opening again. And I think, as the Society of Independent Brewers said, it's also important to open opportunities to small brewers to provide the craft beer that more and more consumers are demanding, and as the GMB said, creating safe, uh, creating and safeguarding jobs in our Scottish breweries. So there's much to look forward to here when this bill gets through. The bill requires the Scottish Government to make regulations that will change the relationship between tied pubs and pub owning businesses to make sure there's fair and lawful trading, that tied pubs should be no worse off than that of free of tie equivalents, and that tied agreements should provide a fair share of risk and reward. And that gets rid of the voluntary self-regulation and gives statutory regulation. And it means that there's clearer sets of rules. And I'm, I'm glad that this bill is going to bring this into play. And in addition, the market rent only option allows a publican to opt out of their tiered agreements, tied agreements, sorry, and to pay a market rent only for their premises. And the evidence from England and Wales is that the MRO rights do give tenants leverage to negotiate fairer deals even if they don't choose to go free of the tie. So it's about choices, it's about fairness. Hopefully it will support our hospitality sector. And it will also give um, something which I suspect one or two colleagues here will like. Tied publicans will have the right to stock one beer of their choosing. And that will allow publicans to respond to consumer demand and make their pub more profitable. And it also enables that support for our Scottish brewers and independent brewers. That has got to be good news for us in Scotland. It will change the landscape for Thai pub tenants, this bill. It will give greater equality to the relationship between tenants and pub co's, and it will open up a bigger market to Scotland's brewers. And I'm really delighted to support this Labour bill today. And I was thinking about all the comments about the work that Neil Bibby has done, this negotiating skills, this persuasion skills. I've been attending a Commonwealth Parliamentary Association conference on 
getting organised for COP26. The last session was about negotiating skills. How do you get the government to do something it doesn't initially agree with you on? I think for the future, Neil Bibby will be one of the people that will talk about how do you get a member's bill that's not going to work to one that goes through, that a parliament supports through lots of hard work by the committee. This is a great example of a bill. I hope we all support it at decision time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Colin Beattie, who will be the last open debate speaker. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I begin by thanking Neil Bibby for bringing this bill forward and for his very open engagement throughout the whole process. This was not an easy bill by any manner of means for the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee to consider. Listening to the evidence over the months raised many question marks. Effectively, there were two sides putting forward evidence. On the one hand, the tenants, and on the other hand, the pub companies or landlords. And frequently, there were significantly differing evidence presented by those two sides, sometimes with one con contradicting the other. Little in the way of independent data was available, and I feel that at times the committee felt concerned that it did not have enough information to reach a conclusion. Hence, I think, the initial rejection of the bill by the committee at stage one. We've seen forceful arguments from the pub landlords that legislating a change in relationship between the tenant and the landlord would lead to dramatic drops in investment in tenanted pubs and create uncertainty and slow recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. On the other hand, equally forceful arguments have been made that the pub codes take an unfair share of profits from the tied tenants, that it would make community pubs more sustainable and increase variety and choice at the bar for customers. It's been difficult to separate out the carefully constructed and presented arguments and to get a grip with what is the best solution. We all want a prosperous and well-run pub sector, which provides both choice and service to its customers, while enabling the tenant to secure a fair income for the work that they commit to the business. On balance, I accept the probability that tenants are at a disadvantage when negotiating with pub landlords. The decision for the tenant to take up the market rent only option is entirely a decision to be made in the light of individual circumstances. Where a good and fair relationship exists with the landlord, it seems to me that it's unlikely that the tenant will wish to disturb that. On the other hand, where a relationship has soured or is perceived as less than fair, then the tenant has the option to change that relationship if they believe that will be of benefit. The concerns about choice of products for customers and indeed the stocking of guest beers and specifically local beers has received considerable attention, and it seems fair to think that a tenant may feel that they have more flexibility in stocking their products to better reflect local tastes if the MRO option is taken. I was of two minds as to whether this bill is needed, but I'm now content that for a few tenants, it may provide a level of protection and an option to reset a relationship which is simply not providing the, the results affected. I believe that to allow pubs to best recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important that we put policies in place that support pubs. And if this will benefit some tenants, then I believe it is worthwhile. Presiding officer, once again, I congratulate Mr. Bibby for bringing forward this bill, and I commend this bill to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches, and I call James Kelly to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I want to join the other members across the chamber in congratulating Neil Bibby in securing a passage later on this evening of his Members' Bill on uh, Tide Pubs. Um, as many have recounted, it's been a long journey for Mr Bibby. Um, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride in terms of getting it through the committee and getting it to this stage, but it's an absolute tribute to his persistence that He's going to achieve this tonight. Uh, I remember in the early, uh, earlier on in the session of the Parliament, going into his office one day, and he had like a list of MSPs up on the wall. It was a bit like one of these elections sort of battleground maps, and, and he had it all charted out as to how he was going to sort of persuade MSPs to support his bill. Um, so he's come a long way since then, and it's great. It's it's great to see the, the success that he's achieved. I think this bill will make a difference. Um, I think pubs do play an important role in their communities. They bring the pandemic has shown that because of they've, they've been closed. Um, they bring people together. Um, they're important for a social aspect. They're also important to support people. 
many people live on their own and their trip to the local pub is maybe their only way of coming into contact with people. So it's important that we support local pubs. What this legislation does is it addresses the balance of power issue between landlords and tenants. Uh, and as Sarah Boyack pointed out, it's all about achieving fairness. Um, I think it's, it's reasonable to say that that balance of power in some instances, the relationship has gone too far in support of you know, big pub businesses. Uh, who sometimes have taken decisions which aren't to the benefit of the landlord or to the local customers. Alec Rowley uh, quoted some vital statistics around uh, wages and prices for local pubs, and, and that showed the, the advantage there would be in giving greater say to landlords. I think the other thing that this legislation does is because it sets up the role of an adjudicator in a statutory code. Uh, it ensures that there's a mechanism there to try and achieve uh, fairness, to try and ensure better wages uh, and also proper proper pricing and a better better choice of uh, beers on the ground. And I think that's why the bill has achieved such a wide range of support from organisations like the Licensed Trade Association, through to GMB and also the Federation of Small Businesses. Uh, that showed that the, the fact that it's attracted that range of support shows that the, 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 the bill will make a difference uh, to businesses, to workers and to customers. And I think ultimately it will help as we emerge out of COVID and we see the shutters come down off the pubs and pubs begin to reopen again. Uh, so it'll be good to see the customers return, but this model will also help uh, promote pubs and that will be good for jobs and that will be good for local economies and local communities. So summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, full congratulations to Neil Bibby for bringing this legislation to a conclusion through the Parliament. The point of Parliament is to, to make a difference. That, that's the point of legislation. And I firmly believe that this legislation will be to the benefit of uh, pubs, uh, pub owners and customers alike. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Margaret Mitchell, who is making her final speech as uh, a member of thank the Thank you, Pub. Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I know how much work goes into introducing a member's bill, so I I uh, congratulate Neil Berry for um, the tenacity he has um, shown in getting to this stage. The, ties, um, the Tied Pubs Bill is legislation which seeks to improve the position of Tied Pub tenants and their pub owning businesses and give Scottish Tied Pub tenants at least the same protections and opportunities as those in England and Wales. This to be realised through, as others have said, the establishment of a Scottish pubs code and the appointment of the Scottish cub, uh, pubs uh, code adjudicator. Key aspects of this um, code include the right to sell a guest beer and the right to pay a market rent on a property without having to buy into other products or services. The bill's overall benefits include promoting owners and tied tenants to work together to ensure that both parties share the profits and risks. Here, COVID has had a massively adverse effect upon Scotland's pubs and publicans, which is why it's all the more important owners and tenants work together to aid the industry's recovery. The bill gives tenants greater choice in running their pub and the opportunity to invest in the business and themselves. Scotland's pubs are a vital part of not only our economy, but of our local communities, with pubs acting as a social hub in villages and communities throughout Scotland. So when we can meet again, customers will be able to enjoy a wider choice of products, and particularly from local independent brewers at more competitive prices. And Scotland's brewing industry will also see a welcome boost and I look forward to voting for the bill at decision time. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, this is my last speech in the Scottish Parliament after 18 years of having had the privilege and pleasure to represent my constituents within Central Scotland region. But the most important and rewarding aspect of being an MSP has been the ability to fight their corner and to help resolve problems and ensure their issues and concerns are not brushed aside but are given a fair hearing. However, as a list MSP, it has been a frustration that rather than being held accountable directly to these constituents when seeking re-election, instead, the regional list MSPs ranking on the list is in the hands of our various parties uh, before the electorate has their say. This, I believe, is a weakness in the Scottish par Parliament's democratic process. Chamber, chamber debates tend to be dominated by party political contributions. By contrast, MSPs work well together on our cross-party groups, such as the CPG on dyslexia, and they seek to take forward the issues raised by the individuals, voluntary organisations and other stakeholders who are members of these groups. I want to return to CPGs in my closing remarks with some suggestions about how we can make the Chamber business more effective. However, before doing so, the atmosphere in the Chamber today has been different from the usual last days of the Parliament when MSPs make their closing speeches. And I want to address the SGHHC inquiry report. For me, the most important findings were not those relating to breaches of ministerial code, but rather the infinitely more worrying revelations about the centralised system of government in Scotland, where the government of the day is all-powerful with an absence of the necessary checks and balances within that system to prevent abuses and to ensure the openness, transparency and accountability essential for any government to establish trust with the electorate. These are issues which will not be easily or quickly resolved, but for all of us in this chamber and for the wider public beyond, a good place to start is with the inquiry report, which can be used as a reference document with the minutes of the committee meetings, the official report of our evidence sessions and the published submissions listed in the annexes. It also has the transcript of the balanced and insightful evidence to brave complainers who had listened to the, the inquiry evidence, including uh, the final evidence sessions from the former First Minister and the First Minister, insisted on giving evidence to the committee on oath and in person. Because if you're anonymous, you have no voice. It was entirely fitting, therefore, that the, the last evidence session from was from the complainers and that they had the last word. <laughs> Abuses of power matter and in any democracy the end doesn't justify the means. This is a stark reminder our democratic freedoms are hard won and can and should never be taken for granted. Presiding officer, in closing, I return again to the Parliament CPGs. My first experience of a, uh, a cross-party group was in 2003, when Annabel Goldie asked me to attend and, um, the adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I have to say from that day on, then I I was full of admiration and remain full of admiration for these um, individuals whose trust has been betrayed in an unimaginable way, very often by the very people in a close family um, context who they could have expected to be protected and for, uh, to, to have protection and to be made safe. It's formed much of the work I focused on as an MSP and the apology bill, which um, 
was actually suggested in one of the cross-party group meetings um, by the former um, Human Rights Commissioner, Commissioner Professor Alan Miller, was something that could give these, um, these victims and um, brave women, and they were largely women, although men also have suffered dreadful abuse, give them the acknowledgement that they seek, the important acknowledgement of the abuse they've suffered. It provides empathy, and for them, most of all, it provides a, a method to ensure that um, the same doesn't happen to anyone else. It's also included arguing for independent legal representation for those victims of rape and other serious assaults, something that's been rejected by the government on various um, legislation and which I hope um, will go forward in the next parliament. But in terms of um, improving chamber time, if the Scottish Parliament cuts out the happy clappy time-filling debates which we all know exist and uses the time for MSPs to raise informed um, issues um, which, have, which have been uh, come about through their work in um, the cross-party group, then this would allow debates and to put forward suggestions at the end of the debate for the Minister to consider and, where possible, to put in place concrete proposals to address these issues raised. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, uh, I want to thank Kate Wayne and um, Claire Wilson for their hard work and support in what has been an exhausting parliamentary uh, session. I look forward to um, spending more time with my family, you, euphemistically, that usually has other connotations, but um, I genuinely mean it. My husband Henry and Westies, Jack and Jamie, and Henry will be um, very pleased, if not little surprised, I put them in that order. And to doing what I want to do, including starting on um, my ever-increasing bucket list. And to those in the chamber, can I wish you well in the future? Those who are standing down, um, uh, I wish you well too. And I hope all these uh, people seeking re-election well, <laughs> do well. And um, it's been a pleasure to work with everyone, to be an MSP in the parliament, and um, good fortune for the future. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Neil Bibby. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking those who have contributed to today's debate, which has been somewhat uh, of a revelation. I was uh, interested to see that both Graeme Simpson and Patrick Harvey, upon receipt of a bottle of beer, decide to hold on to it rather than drink it. This might be the only thing that unites Graeme Simpson and Patrick Harvey. And I want it on the record that when I am presented with a bottle of beer, I opt for a different tact. Uh, can I uh, also say I hadn't envisaged that uh, this would be my last contribution uh, uh, in a debate in this parliamentary session. I think it would be the Thai pub Scotland Bill, but I'm very glad to have been able to take part. Uh, I'm not sure if Margaret Mitchell intended this to be the debate that would be her last ever contribution. She certainly took advantage of the opportunity, and um, I want to wish her well for the future. President Officer, I'll try and confine my remarks because uh, I recognise uh, we uh, are later on uh, now. But uh, I want to say that I recognise that there remain differences of opinion on the merits of this bill. But I think the approach that we have taken, a constructive approach to the bill, has ensured that we have a more balanced and a fairer bill in representing both the interests of tenants and landlords than we had at the outset, while still respecting the fundamental precepts of the bill as envisaged by Mr Bibby. Uh, President Officer, I want to see a successful Thai pub sector in Scotland. I don't think any of us demur from the point of view that Thai pubs are an appropriate model and form of tenure in the pub sector. And I want to see that continue. But I want to see a, a level playing field between uh, tenants and landlords. I want to see tenants treated fairly, and I want to also see landlords being able to 
uh, see a return for their investment. And I think the approach that we've taken through refining and improving this legislation, should it be passed this evening, has enabled us, enabled us to reach uh, that point. So I would urge uh, Parliament to support the legislation and I would conclude by once again uh, congratulating Mr Bibby on reaching this stage and thanking him for his constructive approach in working with me towards uh, the position where we've reached. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. And I call on Neil Bibby to wind up the debate. Thank, th <coughs> thank you, President Officer, and thank you to all members who have participated in this de debate. Can I start by paying tribute to Margaret Mitchell in her final speech? Um, and I know she was of particular help to my constituent, the late Michael McClelland, who was grateful for our support when she was convener of the Justice Committee. Uh, and thank her uh, for that. Um, uh, can I also thank the Minister again for, for the leadership he has shown and for listening to Scotland's Thai publicans um, throughout this process. Um, and can I thank Willie Rennie for his warm words? And I can just say I, 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 I'm sure I couldn't match his charm. Um, but then thanks for, for, for your support, Willie, uh, and the support of the Liberal Democrats who, who were instrumental in this uh, legislation passing at uh, Westminster. I'd uh, also like to thank Patrick Harvey for his long-standing support. I recognise the cross-party group does not have a collective view, but nonetheless welcome his personal commitment and sustained interest in the issue. And I look forward to having that uh, drink with him at, uh, at when Camera Beer Festival is allowed to uh, start up again. Um, I recognise the views of, uh, of members, particularly on the committee, have, have evolved during this process, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, I, I'm aware there continues to be some reservations about it, and, and Graeme Simpson highlighted some of those. You know, I, um, but I, you know, I welcome um, that the, the the collaborative approach, uh, working with the government, and uh, having candid discussions about how the bill can be amended, has led to a position where uh, they have been reassured about the bill today. And I particularly want to thank um, those committee members who have, have spoken in the debate and support the bill, and uh, in particular Andy Whiteman, who has not spoken in the debate for his support as well. Uh, I thank Willie Coffey and Colin Beattie for their contributions. As they rightly said, the debate over Thai pub reform has been described as polarised. There are often different views on how the Thai model operates in practice. That was a feature of the debate in England and Wales before the UK Parliament chose to act. And it has been a feature of the debate here too. As legislators, we regularly have to make decisions where opinion is divided and accounts differ. It's what we are elected to do. But the fact that opinion is divided does not mean that the weight of opinion, or for that matter, evidence, is divided equally. We have to decide whether we take global brewing giants at their word, global brewers like Heineken, who have been fined £2 million for serious and repeated breaches of the pubs code for England and Wales, or whether we accept the outcome of three parliamentary select committee inquiries, my consultation, and the evidence placed before the Economy Committee, which has led to this point. We have to decide whether we accept the evidence put forward by perhaps one of the broadest coalitions ever assembled in support of a member's bill that seeks to intervene in a sector of the economy. The SLTA, CAMERA, FSB Scotland, GMB Scotland, CBA, the British Pub Confederation, the Campaign for Pubs, the Pubs Advisory Service, Ten Tenant Caledonian Breweries, the SDUC and so many more who have been backing Tide Pub Reform. As Greg Mulholland told the committee last year, the number one cause of pub closures is that tenants cannot make a living out of their pub. And Sarah Boyack and James Kelly highlighted the importance of rebalancing the relationship uh, in the Thai pub sector. As Alex Rowley said, the SLT circulated findings of survey today showing that one in three Thai pubs are earning less than £15,000 a year in profit for the tenant, all the while paying excessive markups for the products they sell. I have always accepted there is a place for the Tide model. We are not debating its merits or whether it should continue. If the Tide model is being operated responsibly, as pubcos claimed, then pubcos have nothing to fear from this bill. Why would a publican get in a fair deal report their landlord to an adjudicator? Why would a publican get in a fair deal choose to break the tie and exercise their right to a market rent only option? And why would an adjudicator rule against a pubco already operating consistently with the principles on which this bill is based? But, President Officer, if pub companies are operating in a manner inconsistent with the principles of the bill, publicans will have a recourse to a statutory code, a statutory code to be consulted on by government, approved by parliament and objectively enforced by an independent adjudicator. Finally, President Officer, I want to say a few words about the challenges the pub sector faces now, as members have said. The crisis that we are living through has no precedent in modern times. The impact of the, on this sector has been enormous. As members have said, businesses have been unable to trade for extended periods, and when trading is permitted, many establishments found ongoing restrictions made it unviable. Politicians of all parties have called on the nation to build back better after this pandemic. 
Those calls give new meaning and new purpose to this bill and to a statutory code that can protect Scotland's publicans choosing to do what is best for their pub and best for their customers as we emerge from this crisis. We have an opportunity to secure a fairer deal for tied, Scotland ties pubs tonight. For the good of this interest, industry, it is an opportunity that we have to seize. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Bibby. That concludes debate on the Tide Pub Scotland Bill, and we will move on in a moment to the next item of business. Thank you, colleagues. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 24453 on approval of an SSI. Could I call on Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to speak to and move this motion? Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am sure members are going to miss this decision time highlight as much as I am. <laughs> uh, so, for the final time in this parliamentary session, uh, President Officer, uh, these uh, regulations remove provisions relating to festive gatherings, as they have now served their purpose. The provisions regarding end-of-term households are adjusted so they remain fit for purpose. These regulations remove the requirement for child contact centres to close in Level 4 areas. They adjust the definition of professional sports person and ease the restrictions on libraries to ensure they can open. Finally, these regulations extend the expiry date of the health protection, coronavirus, restrictions and requirements, local levels, Scotland, regulations 2020, and the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Directions by Local Authorities Scotland Regulations 2020 to 30 September 2021. And these regs came into force on 5 March 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The, the question on this SSI will be put at decision time. Now, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. Could I invite the Minister to move such a motion? Uh, move with pleasure, President Officer. Thank you. So the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. So there are three questions uh, this evening. Um, before I put the first question, which will be on legislation, I'm going to, I'm not going to suspend, but I'm just going to pause to allow members to refresh the voting app. So you don't have to put the pin in again, but if members press the refresh buttons and it should come back up with the last vote that you voted on earlier today. Uh, and for those who do need to put the pin in, the pin is treble three seven. Treble three seven for those who haven't voted today, but hopefully most people will have, and they'll just need to refresh their app. So I'll just give a few moments for that to happen. And let me know if, 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 it, if it doesn't refresh, just draw my attention to that. Okay, colleagues, so the first question this evening is that motion 24238 in the name of Andy Whiteman on the European Charter of Local Self-Government Incorporation Scotland Bill at stage three be agreed. Are we all agreed? In fact, sorry, members may press their, may press their voting buttons now. This is a one minute division on the European Charter of Local Self-Government Incorporation Scotland Bill. This is legislation, so we need to cast our votes.
Thank you. The vote is closed. Please let me know if you were not able to vote. Could I call Jamie Green to make a point of order? Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Apologies. Uh, perhaps the office Wi-Fi has failed us one last time. Um, I would have voted yes. Sorry, Mr. Green, I didn't quite catch that. Would you have voted yes? Is that right? Yes, correct. Thank you, Mr. Green. I'll make sure that vote is added. And can I call Beatrice Wishart to also make a point of order? Thank you, President Officer. Um, I don't know what happened. There was a hiccup here, um, and uh, I would have voted yes if the um, system had allowed. Thank you, Ms. Bishard. I'll make sure that your vote yes is also added. The result of the vote on motion 24238 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes 114. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the European Charter of Local Self-Government Corporation Scotland Bill is passed. Now the next question is that motion 24271 in the name of Neil Bibby on the Tide Pub Scotland Bill at stage 3 be agreed. And again, members should press their voting buttons now. This will be a one minute division on the Tide Pubs Bill. That vote is now closed. Please let me know if you were not able to vote. The result of the vote on motion 24271 in the name of Neil Bibby is yes 111. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the Tide Pubs Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> and our final question this evening is that motion 24453 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business uh, in the name of Jeremy Balfour on so Stories of Hope report. But we'll just pause for a few moments uh, to allow some members to leave and other members to arrive. Make sure you, everyone follows the social distancing rules, the one with systems, and wear your masks, please. <laughs>